And so without further ado, um, next slide, please, Jeremy. You hit on one of the disclaimers, but uh, just, just to get it out of the way, the briefing's for information only, so no U.S. government commitment to sell, loan, lease, co-develop, or co-produce defense articles or provide defense services is implied or intended. And as you said, these views are mine and not those necessarily representing the DOD or its components. Slide, please. So what we're going to talk about today is we'll start off with a real world example of the issue, mostly to kind of hammer home what, what scope we're talking about here, because this is, this is a fairly narrow area of the law and dealing with space, so not something people deal with. I know I had never dealt with this before coming to this command. Then second, we'll go through the legal foundations of proportionality, which is really what we're talking about here under international law. We'll measure, we'll talk about the measuring characteristics of proportionality, some of the finer points that again are not necessarily obvious to a layperson. We'll apply the proportionality test. Uh, I'll propose a way to deal with foreseeability in measuring that and we'll walk through three different types of examples of, of how that would look. And then we'll conclude. So next slide, please, Jeremy. So this is not necessarily the exact, a picture of the exact platform that was used, but in 2007, the Chinese government launched a ballistic missile or uh, called an ASAT, an anti-satellite missile. And they shot it at one of their own weather satellites. And this was to test the concept of their anti-satellite or ASAT capabilities where quite literally they just launch a missile and then it detonates and hits a satellite on orbit. Next slide, please. What you're seeing here is a systems toolkit viewer of the 2007 ASAT five minutes post impact. So all of the green dots that you see there orbiting in that orbital plane are all of the debris pieces only five minutes post impact. So you can see that is a lot of debris in the orbit, obviously a lot concentrated around the impact site that's now orbiting our planet. And then next slide shows a couple things. So that shows 11 months post attack, the LEO satellites. So those are most satellites orbiting Earth, and we'll talk more about LEO or lower Earth orbit satellites, which are all about less than or equal to 2,000 kilometers or less above uh, sea level, mean sea level, that are orbiting the Earth. Most are less than about 800 kilometers. And then the, you also see there the little green dot and the green orbital line around there, the little green dot you see in the upper left part of the Earth, that's the International Space Station. So that resides at about 400 kilometers in orbit above the Earth. All of the red you're seeing is all of the debris, as much as they could track it, from the Chinese ASAT test. And then you see all the other dots are all of the other satellites in lower Earth orbit. So you see pretty quickly how this can cause big problems and how congested that environment can become. Next slide, please. So some facts about the, the 2007 Chinese ASAT test. Um, first, it's the largest space debris creation event in history. I put an asterisk there because arguably one could say a project called Project West Forward in the early 1960s the U.S. government deployed a ton of copper wires and needles into orbit um, to try to enable a communications relay. And while it was not intended to be debris and did not result from an impact, the wires did not perform as intended and the project was scrapped. But some of those little pieces still remain in orbit. But in terms of purposeful creation of debris, this is the largest in history. So the results are three plus uh, 3,000 plus debris pieces of trackable size, which is what they call golf ball size or, and larger, 150,000 uh, debris particles, so larger than one centimeter. And then over half the debris is above 850 kilometers in altitude. So we talked about that's kind of the general LEO range. Well, and we'll talk more about orbits in a little bit, but 
um, higher up than that means it takes longer for those pieces to just gradually deorbit and then burn up in the atmosphere. So that means these pieces are going to be around for a very, very long time. And standard LEO orbital speeds, you, you can read some up to 34,000 kilometers an hour. Normally it's about 27, 28,000 kilometers an hour. The ASAT impacted at that, at that speed. So just to truly understand how fast that's going, that is what the orbits in LEO uh, typically are. And that'll create a revolution around the entire Earth in 90 minutes, 120 minutes, just depending on its speed and how far up it is. But that shows you that it's not hard to imagine all of the debris you saw in that viewer created because of the objects that are going that fast. And then kind of why this matters, this last bullet in our next slide. So in April 2011, a piece of ASAT debris passed six kilometers from the International Space Station. And that doesn't sound that scary because it's six kilometers, but from an orbital regime perspective, that's extremely close. And you'll see here in a second why, why that's really, really vital. So why does this matter? Why is all this debris, why does it matter? Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so a few years ago, not from the ASAD debris itself, but a few years ago, um, a little tiny unknown paint flake or a very, very tiny small metal fragment struck the International Space Station. So the debris that struck the space station, and I italicize it there, is, was no bigger than a few thousandths of a millimeter across. So we are talking a minuscule paint flake, let's just say. Because of the orbital speeds that we just talked about that it travels, it created a seven millimeter diameter chip in the ISS window. Now, fortunately, those, the glass is so reinforced that you know, nothing happened. There wasn't any sort of those science fiction movie issues up there. But you can see if a small paint flake can make a chip like that that, we, that some of us have seen in our windshields at times, imagine what any larger piece of debris can do. And some of the data shows us that objects larger than 10 centimeters could shatter a spacecraft into pieces. So again, that's not from the Chinese ASAT that, that uh, place that diameter chip in the ISS window. However, that underscores the importance. And then why all of this matters from a holistic perspective, next slide, please, Jeremy, is the Kessler syndrome. So this was popularized by Donald Kessler at NASA in the late 70s. And essentially it's a theoretical critical mass theory. And ob the more objects you put up there, then the more debris that's created, it cascades. So it's like, um, like an investment account where you want to capitalize your interest and then it continues to build on itself. We've all read about that. That's kind of the principle here in space. So you think a piece of debris hits something, creates more debris, and we're off. So the problem with that is there's potentially a tipping point where the entire environment would be closed for entry. So shown in these four pictures here, the first is, you know, 1950s, what the Earth looked like with the orbital regime, and then progressing through the decades there, where the bottom right is actually what, you know, in a model, of course, what it looks like, our Earth being there almost glowing because of how many objects are orbiting. And then, and we'll talk again more about the orbital, the four orbital regimes, but then you see how many satellites are now around it. So you think a couple of these debris producing events, uh, by militaries or other, or even accidents, can very quickly snowball this where the bottom line is, you know, no Wi-Fi, GPS, TV, radio, radar, weather, communications, all of that. And then just some data. So currently there's about 2,700 satellites in orbit right now. Um, and the numbers differ on based on what open source uh, you use, but so double that number um, are either dead or lost where the oper owner operators have, um, have lost contact with their satellites or, or it just died and didn't move to the graveyard orbit, which is a designated area where old dead satellites go. And then ESA uh, estimates that space objects 10 centimeters or greater, there's about 29,000 of them in orbit. Larger than one centimeter, there's about 670,000 and then larger than one millimeter, and I say those, those numbers and recall the ISS window, 
of not even a millimeter large paint flake hitting it. They estimate that there's over 170 million uh, objects larger than a millimeter. So you can see how this Kessler syndrome, he was, he was very prescient in, in understanding the late 70s, the problem. So next slide, please. So some of you might have been doing that. Um, so you can see why this is a vital issue. So, OK, let's take it down. Let's see how this is evaluated. Let's kind of parse through this. Next slide, please. So first to clarify, and a lot of these slides are pretty wordy and I apologize, but it's a lot of information and obviously you can digest as, as I talk through them. But um, so some clarifications with proportionality and kind of the way that we're working the analysis here. So for these purposes, assume necessity, humanity, distinction, essentially all the LOAC principles in conflict have been met. So we as legal practitioners are looking at this, just one of the elements. And I know the distinction issue, uh, squadron leader Tinkler briefed on last month, talking about military objectives. So assume those are those are met and assume that everything's lawful, but for, okay, we've got to now assess proportionality. So when we do that, we're measuring collateral effects when actioning any space target in conflict. We will not address the attack threshold. So whether or not again, whether it's legal to maybe act in self-defense or or have a use of force or armed attack. And then just note the ASAT, to clarify, the ASAT test that, I, that we discussed shows the consequences, but is separately governed. So countries using their own tests is obviously not in conflict against an adversary. And I will also not talk about the impact of the liability convention, which followed on from the Outer Space Treaty discussing liability, basically financial liability for countries causing damage. And that's been invoked once uh, with a, a craft that landed in Canada. But um, I will not go into that because that's almost think more of a civil remedy. This is in conflict as legal advisors dealing with proportionality. And then finally, note that we kind of have to just extrapolate existing international law. So and we'll talk about the OST, the DOD law or manual, um, uh, additional protocol one, Geneva Convention. So we have to just apply that as best we can to outer space's unique features. And then we're not going to assume just as a basis uh, that there's suspension of treaties and customary international law in conflict. So I know that's a widely debated legal issue and some treaties may contemplate or bilateral agreements contemplate the suspension. We're not going to assume that and we're going to take what we have and apply it into space, which is what we essentially do every day at the operational level. Next slide, please. So our legal foundations, um, additional protocol one to the Geneva Conventions, just kind of a housekeeping, uh, Russia, China, most of Europe, Canada, Australia, they're full state parties, meaning they signed and ratified. The US signed AP1, we did not ratify, but we ascribed to most provisions, including the AP1 section on proportionality. So there's some debates and the law war manual has, a, has an aside where, um, and other documents where DODs reviewed it, and it's split on whether or not it's actual customary international law, that section. But the US ascribes to AP1 on proportionality as evidenced by the law war manual and other formative documents that guide DOD practitioner. Iran and Pakistan also signed but did not ratify. And then kind of as a gee whiz, especially as um, Israel, India and Turkey develop space capabilities, just to note they've never, they never actually signed additional protocol one. Next slide, please. So which part of AP1 controls here? What, what do we care about? So that section and the wording is really, really important. That's why I put it up. I know it's not great to quote in PowerPoint, but I put it up because the wording is super important, but an attack which may be expected to cause incidental loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, damage to civilian objects, or a combination thereof and then the key, which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and military, direct military advantage anticipated. Uh, subsequent article in AP1 repeats the standard, and we'll, we'll pull apart the standard a little bit more. And it's also echoed essentially word for word in the DOD Law War Manual in several different places. So the takeaways from this, it's an ex-ante uh, commander balancing test. So there's lots of, of, um, of academic works, and I, I agree with them fully that this anticipates going in a commander 
his or her legal advisor, you're going to try to figure this out prior to. It's very easy if something doesn't go the way that as intended to then come down and say that was unlawful or that was improper. But you have to understand this is before and an ex post analysis um, is kind of not fair because that's not how this is contemplated. And then the circumstances ruling at the time is important. And then also there's a good faith element to this. I didn't want to put up a ton of, of, the, of the literature that surrounds this, but that's kind of what we're working with here. And then another really, really important point is the focus here is civilians and civilian objects. So there's really no such thing as a proportionality issue or a violation of, of proportionality if you inadvertently damage more military objects than you intended. So I don't know, an example is if an unparked or a, an uninhabited just tank sitting there in a conflict, you blow it up and it turns out it also takes out you know, a military MRAP vehicle, a minor resistant vehicle parked nearby. There is no argument that, that I could see for a proportionality issue, even though you actually did more quote damage than you thought you did. The key is civilians and civilian objects. You see the qualifiers there in AP1 and that's something to remember. And then excessive is, as far as I could find, undefined in international law. So the key there, which would be excessive in relation to, that's a tough term because it's a balancing test, but it's not necessarily a full 50-50 weight. I don't know if it's a 51-49 weight. I don't know if it's 70-30, but it's what would be excessive in relation to the direct military advantage anticipated. So you're looking at direct military advantage, balance against your civilian loss, whether that be objects or personnel, and that can't be excessive. So that's kind of what we, we have. Next slide, please. We'll talk about some of the measuring capabilities or measuring characteristics, excuse me. So collateral damage versus collateral effects. Some of you have seen I've used collateral effects phraseology, not necessarily collateral damage. Well, collateral damage is pretty well known um, in terms of terrestrial targeting and law of armed conflict. A good way of thinking about it is all collateral damage is collateral effects. However, all collateral effects is not necessarily collateral damage. So collateral effects is a more all-encompassing term. And you'll see here shortly when we're talking about non-kinetic or temporary reversible space capabilities that can affect um, on-orbit assets are, don't, don't really create any collateral damage. Additionally, there is no collateral damage methodology codified for space and temporary reversible and whatnot. There's little to no recorded official state practice in terms of space collateral effects, and I use those as terms of art. There's really nothing codified in international law, and there's a lot of theorized approaches. And so having said that, there's no agreement on how to analyze a second and third order effects. So, and we'll see in the examples, this is not necessarily talking about those big debris causing issues, because you can make a definite argument. There's collateral damage there, and we could maybe use some of the more codified methodology there. What I'm talking about, and we'll get to it in two of the three examples, where you have to deal with that gray area where you're not necessarily impacting something, you're not running it in to something, or you're not shooting a missile into space to hit something. What do we do when we're impacting you know, satellites um, up in orbit with non-kinetics? So, a lot of times, you know, we do look to cyber as maybe persuasive guidance because the capabilities are similar from a legal standpoint and an operational standpoint. So the Talon manual, which for those of you who don't know, is there's now two, there's a Talon 2.0. So that is the kind of compendium of, of experts that got together and they have over the past few decades to write what they advise to be the state of the law or what should be the state of the law as to cyber operations. So rule 113 commentary of, of Talon says you must anticipate, they call them knock-on effects, but you must anticipate any expected indirect effects. Michael Schmidt is kind of the godfather of, of the cyber law and the Talon manuals. He he's talked about measuring all reasonably foreseeable effects. So, so why this matters is when you're doing a collateral effects analysis for you know, let's say targeting or operations in a conflict as a legal advisor, you're trying to figure out, okay, how far attenuated do I have to measure or, or 
study or look at or describe for my commander to make that balancing test exactly like we just talked about that ex ante weight test. So those two cyber um, proposals talk about expected indirect and all reasonably foreseeable. I will push back here. And I think squadron leader Tinkler actually, I loved his example that he gave last month in talking about uh, proportionality a little bit when he was talking about military objectives, but he brought it up like a lottery ticket. And I think the reason why maybe a reasonably foreseeable test is not uh, the best one to use. He said like a lottery ticket, when you buy a lottery ticket, so you go, you get a quick pick at the, at the gas station and it's the Powerball and it's a yeah, $200 million Powerball. Well, is it reasonably foreseeable that you could win the lottery and win $200 million with a lottery ticket? Yes, it's reasonably foreseeable. However, the chances are so slim, it is one in millions and millions. It is not practically foreseeable to, um, to think that you're going to win the lottery. So similarly, by saying, hey, what are all the reasonably foreseeable effects when I, let's say, put energy on a satellite or try to target something in space, I, I posit that it's almost impossible to know every single effect that could possibly happen. And we, we'll talk about that more in the applications. Another example that where it's hard to figure out, okay, how attenuated are we going to be is take a steel factory. So let, let's assume that all of international law agrees the steel factory primarily is right behind the front lines or on the front lines, let's say in Yemen, it is providing uh, material directly to ISIS uh, fighters that are you know, fighting the, the local government and um, everybody would agree for, from necessity, um, humanity, distinction, that that's a valid military target. It would be hard to say or to know, oh, actually in the morning, that steel factory, which is a civilian owned technically, so it's a dual use target and we'll hit on that, but that steel factory actually was going to deliver heart monitors and material to the local hospital treating those injured and wounded the next morning and you blew up the steel factory and thus you inhibited the ability to provide for the civilian population. So you could argue that's a certainly a collateral effect and that is something that is um, not appropriate. However, to, to know that level of fidelity of information and to adequately measure it prior to striking is very difficult and I would argue almost impossible. So what we have looked at is maybe directly foreseeable. And I know that that's not a huge, that's not a huge difference in terms of wording, but we all know as lawyers, one word can mean everything. So directly foreseeable, what do we know will directly result? What can we directly foresee from what we're going to do or another country is going to do right now with the knowledge base that we have? So in our examples uh, that we'll go through, I, I talk about it in a directly foreseeable manner because for the reasons I've just stated, I think that that's a better way of measuring. And so now we'll talk about some measuring characteristics. One last slide before we jump into our three examples. So when we talk about the satellite itself, so if you have a satellite and last month's brief got into this, so I'm not going to, to belabor it, but so if you have, let's say a military satellite, that's a valid military target. target. Let's say it's a, you know, United States military owned and operated satellite up there performing military purposes, it would pass that distinction test, it's a valid target. A dual use target is something that has some sort of civilian operation or ownership. Um, so many satellites are like that. You take it through the military objective test. <clears throat> Again, that was brief last month and it would probably pass the test. <clears throat> Then you have non-military satellites. So truly commercial satellites owned and operated by civilians have nothing to do with the military. <clears throat> Without a doubt, that would be an invalid target. So for the purposes of our examples or thinking through these things from a distinction perspective, under the law of armed conflict, we would think about either military or even potentially dual use targets. I talked about the LEO orbit earlier. So we talked about the lower Earth orbit, and just, just so we're tracking and, and for fidelity, especially as we go through our examples, so MEO is what's called Middle Earth orbit, and that is around 20,000 kilometers uh, from mean sea level. 
that is a unique orbit. It's about 12 hour rotations around the earth. And that's a unique orbit where position navigation and timing satellites like GPS reside because the coverage regime they've determined is ideal at that orbit. And so when you pop on your phone and try to get a map somewhere, that's what you're using. It's actually kind of cool. It's a satellite at 20,000 kilometers above sea level, but that's, that's what's in MEO orbit typically. Geo orbit is a uh, geosynchronous orbit. And what that is, is about 35,000 kilometers from mean sea level. That is a point that matches the exact orbit of Earth. I think it's something like 23 hours, 56 minutes. Um, so that matches the Earth's rotation exactly such that you are staring, the satellite is staring at one exact point at all times without uh, deviation. These are really good for communication satellites, weather satellites and things like that. It would make sense communications because you wanna be able to ping that satellite and come back and have coverage over those areas all the time. And then finally, highly elliptical orbits are, are very, as, as the name suggests, elliptical orbits. So think a very, very ocular orbit or oval shaped orbit where it, it shoots around very briefly one side of the earth and then dwells you know, hours and hours and hours over the other side of the earth. These are good for, again, a very, very long extended uh, time, dwell time on a certain area. So again, lots of communication satellites are, are in that regime. Then when we say transponders, so satellites, communication satellites carry transponders and they may carry several transponders on a single satellite. And that individual transponder can carry or relay you know, 20 plus individual signals to users on it. So one single transponder might be dedicated to you know, a small number of users and areas, whereas other transponders on you know, other satellites, they may carry signals that are going to all over Europe and the Middle East or all over the US and Canada. And so it just depends on the satellite and, and what it's being used for. But when we say that, that word, that's what that means. Um, and again, a, a commercial satellite might have, you know, I don't know, 20 signals on a certain transponder running on it. And let's say one might be military. So that would be like a dual use satellite, of course. And then you'd have to analyze whether or not it met the, the requirements for distinction to actually do something to it. Uh, but for our purposes, just note that those transponders can be really intermingled and mixed in terms of what they're carrying. And then finally, when we say signal, we're talking about one individual you know, RF radio frequency signature that is, that is going up through a satellite and to a user. And when we say uplink and downlink, we're talking about how that signal environment or when essentially during the signal path, it might be looked at or targeted or what have you. So if you're getting after an uplink, an uplink, let's say for just simple purposes is coming up from a TV station. So let's say, I don't know, NBC is pushing up an uplink signal. It will hit a satellite, uh, hit, go through a transponder, and then that signal is shot out to all different users all over the place. So if you affect an uplink, you're, as far as I understand it, then you would potentially affect all the downlinks, whereas the downlinks are where you have those individual signals on them going to that individual user. So for our purposes here, that's when I use these terms here momentarily when we're looking at studying it. And this is the level of fidelity that I think space legal advisors have to get down to and why the learning curve is pretty significant is, and one of my recommendations for anybody that wants to get into this is you have, you have to understand, and that was just one slide. I mean, you have to understand the absolute details just like in cyber and, uh, and other, not necessarily non-terrestrial, um, based systems and platforms. You got to get with your planners and operators. You got to understand the capabilities and what you're really dealing with. Because if you're asked, hey, okay, what's my collateral effects? If you don't know what signals are like, you don't understand how transponders work, you can't as a legal advisor make those uh, recommendations. So now with our legal and operational framework, we can go ahead and start applying what we have talked about. Next slide, please. So let's apply this in our first example. So think essentially like the 2007 ASAP, but let's pretend that instead of a test on their own satellite, some country in a conflict blew up, let's say a US military tracking satellite. 
So again, um, or let's say we wanted to do that to somebody. Um, so let's, we would need to balance for proportionality. And again, assume all the other tenants of, of low acromet, we would have to have to balance the damage to civilians and civilian objects and whether or not that is excessive versus the military gain expected, the direct military gain. So we would ask, okay, using that term of art that we talked about, what are the directly foreseeable effects in the circumstances ruling at the time? I say directly foreseeable again, not reasonably foreseeable, not possible, directly gonna happen from this. Well, we know, and the example that we started with today shows that the immense damage to the orbital environment essentially will occur. We know that for sure. Now, the level of fidelity that the mapping will, will do or that the folks are able to study, you know, that obviously depends on capabilities and where you're at. But we know for a fact that was easy to see tons of damage to the orbital environment, especially if lower Earth orbit, like I said, because about you know, two thirds, let's say, of satellites are in lower Earth orbit. The damage will be to all, so including civilians, other militaries. So I say other militaries, and you might think, well, you just said that that doesn't matter, but I'm thinking other countries' militaries that are not in a conflict. And then human spaceflight. We saw just a tiny, tiny fleck of paint can uh, gouge a window of the ISS. I think a larger, um, a larger piece might actually have you know, fatal consequences. So also the satellite itself, if civilian owner operator, like we talked about before, it's not even you know a valid military target. And then one caveat though is the weaponeering, the impact angle, the speed, orbital regime, all of that matters. So a simplistic example is let's say the ASAT device shot straight up and impacted as it's traveling up from the atmosphere on the satellite. You can imagine the impact and orbital debris would shoot you know up essentially in layman's terms up from the orbit pushing it further away from the atmosphere and blowing it more into the orbit uh, of the earth and which would now take longer to come down longer to work its way out on the other hand if a missile were to actually hit a satellite coming down as i understand it coming down towards the atmosphere it would blow the debris towards the atmosphere it would reduce the amount of debris up there, certainly the length of time it was up there. And then most of it would burn up hopefully sooner rather than you know centuries, which is potential. So those types of issues um, matter in terms of how much debris are we actually talking about in terms of our directly foreseeable effects. And those are, God forbid, we ever had to truly advise this, that would be the questions that you would probably wanna ask. And then you balance all of that against the concrete and direct military advantage gain, you know, quoting straight out of AP1, so what would happen? Okay, what if, if a military wanted to do this? Well, you're probably neutralizing some, if not all, of adversary space capabilities at that point. Because if you're if you're going to ruin the orbital environment, if not the moment it happens, you know, soon now that everything's going around there, it's almost like you're shaking up a, a Coke can or something. At that point, you know that, especially if you do more than one or multiple, and again, depending on how you're going to strike it, you're going to wreck a lot of the orbital environment. And so I always say it's obviously conflict and actor dependent on that military advantage gain. The law war manual talks about that a lot in terms of the circumstances. And so I underline existential because I would find it difficult to imagine as a legal advisor where you could ever argue that you would find or that you would advise to a commander that, yep, my, uh, you know, the civilian potential loss here is um, not excessive compared to your military advantage gain. I would have to think. Um, it has to be an existential crisis for, for a country. And essentially they would need to say, we have to just shut down space. Our adversary has such a control over space. They're enabling all their operations so much. We have to just close it off for their use. And otherwise we risk complete you know, existential crisis. So fortunately this wasn't an issue uh, back in World War I, World War II, but you could see how heaven forbid that this, these types of conversations would happen in those types of existential crises. But a regional or even potentially global conflict just among, you know, let's say powers, um, I find it hard to believe that, that they would pass that uh, proportionality weight in those circumstances. So now we'll go to a less ominous example. 
uh, the second of three applications are non-temporary and non-reversible effects to an on-orbit satellite. So think that here you're going to do something like a, let's say cyber, because we've all read it in the news where you might, um, again, using space capabilities, but just for purposes of example, cyber where you might be able to um, do something to a satellite or its you know, control components whereby it would hinder that satellite's ability to function, however that may work. So you are, you are damaging the satellite or again, it's, it's regime such that they can't really use it. And so what are the directly foreseeable effects um, in circumstances ruling at the time? So the Talon Manual talks about for measuring whether or not an attack has occurred, talks about, okay, maybe there's a distinction between having to replace physical parts. Maybe yes, that's an attack for purposes of international law versus maybe reinstalling an operating system, just having to essentially think, you know, on your computer, you've got to reinstall windows or something on a satellite or a cyber, or a cyber system. Maybe that's not an attack. And I, I'm not talking, I'm not using those examples, conflating the two, in, improperly conflating the two of attack analysis versus proportionality uh, for a, a proper low act strike. But I liked those examples because it helps us think about, okay, in terms of directly foreseeable effects and what we're balancing, I think that shows a good hierarchical order of, okay, if we know all they're gonna have to really do is reinstall an operating system, so it might be a couple hours, that helps us as legal advisors understand when we're talking to our commanders about balancing that uh, civilian loss versus a military gain. Whereas let's say, yeah, you're actually going to essentially break that transponder where they're either gonna have to shut it down, they're gonna have to fix it. I don't know how they're gonna get it fixed in space. That would be a different proportionality thought. Again, all, all talking about civilian objects, that would be a different level of analysis and weight versus those military gains. Again, same here, weaponeering matters, extent of effect matters, what you're doing, the extent of civilian use matters. Again, like we talked about, if it's a you know, civilian satellite, which is what we're talking about here, or if it's a governmental satellite where civilian signals are running on it, that all matters from a civilian collateral effects standpoint for us as legal advisors, because how, based off of the effect you're trying to use, how extensively are we actually affecting civilians as well as obviously our military target? So the extent of a civilian use on a satellite, let's say you have a commercial satellite and there's, I don't know, 50 signals running through it. One is military and the other 49, and we'll talk about signals as I note there in the next example. But um, if it's only one military and we're gonna force them to replace physical component parts of a satellite, Again, that matters on our balance. The next bullet there that matters on our balance, what are we actually gaining military advantage wise versus damaging civilians? So, okay, let's say we do this. We can neutralize a specific adversary capability like intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance or comms or something like that. And again, of course, it's gonna be conflict and actor dependence. So is this a, a, just a regional uh, dust up? Is this some sort of global um, conflict? This is maybe a more, practical thought exercise than maybe the destructive tests in, in a you know non-existential conflict where you would actually really have to question this and look and you know maybe a, a commander uh, through using international IP1 and through its country specific guidance would actually say yep this is viable this is the collateral effects are not excessive compared to our military advantage gain we know we're going to break some of the stuff on the satellite um not speak about any capabilities that could or could not do that or how that would work. I'm not 100% sure, but that's definitely something that, that would come into play. Um, next slide, please. We'll go into our last example. So the third of three here is a temporary reversible effect. So think jamming here. So we've all read or, or thought about, okay, you're gonna jam the signal or you're gonna jam that satellite. So the way I understand it, what that would be is you're essentially putting energy on either through and trying to get after like an uplink or a downlink, whatever's going to receive the signal. So let's say you're targeting an uplink and uh, you would go after a transponder that's going to receive the signal, then that's going to mess with the signal going out to everybody else. Like we talked about, that's why I talked about uplink and downlink earlier. So let's say you're going to jam something. Capability agnostic and just saying, okay, you're going to interfere 
by messing with that uh, radio frequency spectrum. So that's what that's what uh, you know the planners want to do. So as a legal advisor, you'd say, okay, what are my directly foreseeable effects in the circumstances ruling at the time? Again, weaponeering is really important here um, because like I talked about, are you just going to affect some downlink recipient, just that one user, um, maybe that one you know, local NBC station or those TVs in the, uh, in the living rooms? Or are you going to affect an uplink where, oh my gosh, it's going to go all over the place? Are you going to affect a transponder that relays a ton of the signals? So all that matters when you're talking about, okay, how are we going to affect and what are going to be my directly foreseeable effects? Do we know all the signals and recipients? Um, what if the signal is going to jump around? Is it time sensitive? Because again, all of this is um, ex ante. All this is before. It's what we know. It's the circumstances ruling at the time. So that's not an excuse. And I don't try to cabin that, uh, couch that as an excuse to, oh, well, this is all we knew at the time. It's not a cop out to not do the homework or not have the intel or the planners do their homework. But again, time sensitivity certainly matters. If it's easy to understand in a conflict, if you have two weeks to prepare and analyze versus two hours based off of something that's really going, that's happening, that matters. And so those are the questions you would ask. Um, obviously it's going to be dependent on every single situation. But those are the questions legal advisors should ask in terms of what are my directly foreseeable effects. And then you measure it against a concrete direct military advantage gain. Again, the same balancing test. So here you're going to neutralize a pretty specific adversary capability because when you're talking about an individual signal, you're going to take out, let's say, their comms or maybe they're using their uh, television broadcast for you know, some sort of command and control of a, of a war effort. So that's what we're going to get after or hopefully get after. And then always, always, it's conflict and actor dependent. So one can see very easily how it would be a lot easier to make the military advantage gain not being uh, excess or resulting in excessive civilian loss maybe here um, because there's not a ton of, of civilian loss, whereas, hey, maybe you might get a really nice military advantage. Um, by taking out a specific adversary capability and by saying it's temporary reversible, you're not damaging the satellite. You're not making any sort of effect where they've got to replace a part. You're just temporarily and reversibly interfering with that signal environment that an adversary is using. So, and then I, I pause it down there and I kind of will, will leave you all with this question. Do we even need to do a proportionality analysis at all with a temporary reversible effect? So probably some of the Anybody on this, um, on this webinar that maybe has dealt with this before kind of thinks about it that way. And there's really not any international law base that I could find. The Outer Space Treaty doesn't get into this level of fidelity with it. One could argue it's maybe violating the due regard or harmful interference provisions. But again, those are not necessarily defined anywhere. So it, it could, you could make an argument that for doing temporary reversible effects like this in application three, I think you can't make the same argument for uh, applications one and two because you're really damaging stuff at that point. And especially in the first example, you're creating mass civilian loss or potential civilian loss. But in this third example, if we're just doing a temporary reversible effect, is there anything really unlawful about that? Or is there anything that really you could say um, is actually a directly foreseeable effect that we have to care about because it's just temporary reversible. So for proportionality purposes, again, not dealing with whether or not this is an attack under international law, whether or not not dealing with countermeasures or retortions, but from a proportionality analysis in conflict as a legal advisor, one could argue, and I don't think it's settled in international law, if it's just temporary reversible, do we really even have to do the proportionality analysis? I would advise just in my personal capacity, it's probably wise to. Um, it's probably a good responsible state actor practice to do it, but there's an argument out there and I wanted to at least address that. So now with about 12 minutes remaining, Jeremy, I was close to my target. Um, I will open it up for questions. Uh, and yeah, sorry, there's the conclusion. That's what we talked about. Any questions, I will stand by and I appreciate it. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Major Zellner. Really appreciate it. It looks like we do have a couple of questions that are coming in uh, through the chat. Um, first question um, 
which uh, is sort of written in the form of a comment, but I'll kind of questionize it, uh, is from um, Gies Van Haprin. Uh, and so um, uh, Mr. Van Haprin wants to ask about example number three, what would you what would you think in terms of interfering with the business of a state? Would that be um, would that be something that would rise to the level of an attack, even if it was reversible uh, or temporary? Um, or could that proportionality uh, test maybe come into play if? the business of a state was significantly interfered with based on whatever this temporary or reversible effect to the satellite was? I appreciate that question. It's a great question. So that that kind of brings up two different issues. So you have the first, the, the attack, but on that, I would also say there's a distinction question there. So like was briefed last month, in talking about distinction, you, you ask whether or not um, a the nature location purpose or use of an object, and it's a very long uh, analysis, but essentially whether that contributes to the military uh, action or advantage of the adversary, and then if it's neutralization, um, total or partial contributes or gives us or whatever actor direct military advantage. So you would absolutely analyze that first when you're talking about your distinction arm of your LOAC. So you'd first have to say, okay, if this is if we're targeting something and let's say it is a government, you know, a civilian government signal or capability, does that meet the distinction test to even target that specifically? If it meets the distinction test and you're either targeting it or it is a victim of what you end up doing and it has met the distinction test, then you would not necessarily analyze it for, from proportionality because it, at that point it's not a civilian non-military aspect. On the other hand, let's say it's not, let's say it's, you know, civilian, it's there, I don't know, some environmental um, or some sort of just, you know, news agency, something like that, some sort of civilian capability, uh, truly non-military related, that, that absolutely, you would have to try to figure that out. And that, that in application three, you'd say, okay, what is my level of damage here? And the problem with that is a lot of times the fidelity, not speaking to any nation's intelligence capabilities, just saying, I imagine it is difficult to ascertain on, let's say, a satellite right at this moment and then whenever you're going to action it. Every user, every recipient, every signal, you saw how many signals will run on an individual satellite. So if you know for a fact that a civilian government is going to be affected, a civilian government signal is going to be affected, then you would have to, and it's not military related, it wouldn't pass the distinction test, you'd absolutely have to weigh that. And again, it's all a balancing test to say, okay, is this civilian, I don't know, weather signal right now for the next 10 minutes, does that out, does damaging that, is that excessive in relation to whatever military advantage? And let's say you're trying to go after an adversary's command and control and they're about to have a landing on your shores. Well, maybe not, maybe that's not excessive, but maybe it is excessive depending on what civilian signal it is. So on the proportionality front, uh, kind of in conclusion on this one, and that's such a great question, you have to first ascertain, can I even figure out all the signals? And then what's directly foreseeable if I can, does that outweigh the military, or is that excessive in relation to the military advantage gain? Excellent, thank you. Um, so for attendees, uh, just real quick, remember you can either put your questions into the Q&A um, box, or I believe that you're able to chat uh, directly to um, us as panelists, although perhaps not with each other. So feel free to go ahead and continue putting questions um, into either of those locations if you have any. Uh, as, I, as I wait for some additional questions to, to come through, uh, Major Zellner, quick question from me. Uh, this is also uh, in response to kind of your scenario three example with respect to um, kind of the, the temporary or reversible interference with satellite signals. Uh, and my question would be, uh, could you speak very briefly perhaps about, uh, it seems like this sort of interference with satellites, um, you know, the radio spectrum interference is 
one way in which maybe countries that aren't as sufficiently developed technologically from a space perspective um, can cause mischief right on the international stage. For instance, Iran um, has exhibited some fairly maybe sophisticated spoofing or jamming capabilities for satellites. Uh, I know a couple of years back, right, they were interfering with GPS signals for shipping in the Gulf so that they could lure ships into Iranian waters and the like. Uh, could you speak to that issue, perhaps this, this use of spoofing or jamming, um, you know, maybe for terroristic purposes or um, outside of this context, perhaps of armed conflict between states that are at war, how those, uh, how those issues work and maybe what we can do about them? So two things there, Jeremy, I appreciate the question. Um, so one, that that's kind of a bear of an issue in terms of the lawfulness of jamming out, outside of conflict. Um, I think there are fair arguments on, on either side. I probably can't get into it here. I don't want to step in anything, but that that raises an issue and anything you see in open source or the news, just like cyber attacks, I mean, stuff happens and dealing with it outside of conflict brings up because you have to figure out whether or not that activity is unlawful. If it's unlawful outside of conflict, we know that, that countries um, through the Nicaragua case and the customary international law that's developed since then could potentially resort to countermeasures where a nation can act unlawfully in response to an unlawful act to try to get that actor to stop its unlawful act must be necessary and proportionate, and then it must cease once the, the unlawful actor has stopped its original unlawful activity. So that obviously underscores the unlawfulness to be able to conduct a countermeasure. Now, if you argue that it's lawful, then uh, I guess a country could do it back uh, in a lawful manner. And then if it is unlawful, also you could do what's called a retorsion under international law. It's talked about, um, again, in international law and the DoD war, law war manual where you, you perform a lawful act in response to an unlawful act. You're essentially justifying your lawful act to similarly try to get the actor to stop an unlawful act. So think about severing of diplomatic relations or an embargo or something like that, that would try to press that actor into stop its unlawful act. On your question of a country with less space capability, you know, jamming or spoofing or even debilitating other country space capabilities, I think that comes exactly into conflict and actor dependence, your weight. So if, let's say if we were a country with little to no space capabilities, um, but we had a, an ability to interfere with the adversary space capabilities pretty easily, then your military advantage gained is so much more versus any sort of civilian loss in that balancing test. Because like I talked about even with an existential crisis. So if, if our country has virtually no space capabilities and we can debilitate the other actors space capabilities, which we are absolutely getting killed on right now because we have nothing, uh, no play. We don't really have you know, radar and comms and all that like the other adversary does. The gain, the military advantage gain is huge for us weighting that against any civilian loss. So I think that's where that would come into play if you are an actor without a lot of space capabilities versus being able to say, well, their space capabilities are not, are not really impacting the fight as much or we have so many redundancies, it's not that big of a deal. Hope that answered the question. No, that was great, thank you. Uh, any further questions for Major Zellner? I haven't seen anything else come into the chat. I'll just give it, uh, you know, maybe another minute or two. I know that we're approaching our uh, 9 a.m., um, at least Mountain Time, uh, kind of hour cutoff, um, but we're happy to stay for a couple extra minutes if uh, additional questions are coming through. So just a quick comment. I, I saw the I saw the chat where it was talking about it would be required in response to an attack. Yeah, absolutely. So in talking about um, we're talking in conflict, law of armed conflict would apply whether or not we're responding to an attack or a deliberate attack pursuant to a larger scale conflict, assuming all the other legalities. So yeah, you, you'd have to measure this um, in all those situations. And again, as legal advisors, I think a lot of times it's about asking the right questions, um, understanding the capabilities, and then being able to um, advise the commander where that person can make that weight analysis. And you know, honestly, they have the, the harder job. We just kind of lay it up uh, with everything that we can find. 
But Major Zellner, I just wanted to thank you, first of all, for your time this morning. We really, really appreciate uh, you, know, you joining us for this webinar series, um, giving us this presentation. Um, very fascinating stuff, and I think that we all learned a lot. So thank you for that. Uh, Major Zellner, do you have any concluding remarks? Just say thank you so much again. This was all, you know, my, my personal opinion, my personal views. And um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, hopefully, if nothing else, I've cured any bouts of insomnia for people. But hopefully, you you got some interesting takeaways. And uh, just let me know if you want to have some follow-on talks afterwards. And thanks again, Jeremy, for for holding these events and having me. I appreciate it.